Okay, great, let's get started. Uh, for our next session, we have two invited talks. Our first invited speaker is JJ Park. JJ is a brand new assistant professor in computer science. He just joined university about a month ago. And before that, he was a postdoc at Stanford. And prior to that, got his PhD at University of Washington. Uh, JJ, uh, broadly speaking, works in computer vision and computer graphics. And his work has had a lot of impact over the years, uh, really changing how people represent 3D models and reconstruct them from images. So I'm excited to hear what he has to say. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Andrew, for the introduction. So today I'm going to talk about um, um, the title of my talk is going to be Responsible AI and Responsibility of AI. And as you introduced, I'm a very new assistant professor um, CSE. So if you, uh, if you want to say hi, please come by my office. So the content of the talk um, is going to be um, so my background in 3D generative models. Yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, my background in 3D generative models and then um, briefly touch on the possible threats of these technologies and then suggest some remedies. And then I'm um, going to talk about the promises of these AI, AI technologies to uh, our society. So my research lies at the intersection of computer vision and computer graphics. And more specifically, I do 3D reconstruction, which means you're trying to recover the 3D structures of the world from 2D or 2.5D images. And I also uh, study 3D generative models, where you um, try to come up with new content, um, conditional or unconditioned on human inputs. And some of the applications of these technologies are obviously content creations. So it could be used for entertainment or education purposes. Uh, it could also be used for robotics or uh, self-driving. Um, or medical imaging or scientific modeling that requires 3D reasoning, 3D reconstruction, or generative models. So early in my PhD, I um, focused on recovering the physical structures of the world from 2D images. So um, a lot of it has to do with recovering the camera poses, the geometry, lighting, surface material uh, from these uh, images, multiple images. And then once you recover the, uh, the physical properties of the scene, you can use it for interesting applications, such as uh, like this. So given a video of a shiny bag of chips, our method was able to recover these detailed scene lighting, so environment, uh, which is really, really difficult to do with naked human eyes. And also, we can try to render this scene from arbitrary perspective that you haven't recorded. So it's called uh, novelty synthesis. So you can see that our rendering models really correctly recovers the physical properties of the scene, and thus you can render this from arbitrary perspective. However, I quickly realized during my PhD that these physical properties are not enough, because the images that we capture only captures the observed parts of the scene. So vast amount of this, the part of the scene remains unobserved and unreconstructed, so uh, we cannot render them or we cannot do any simulations or interactions with these parts of the scenes that are uh, invisible to your. So an example would be these scenes where you have desks and chairs. The big parts of the chairs are, are missing from your observations. So these constraints is that the physical modeling alone can only recover the visible information. And the question is, how should we complete the unobserved parts of a scene? Or even better, how should we create the entire new scenes that, that doesn't exist in the world? So this comes into play how we connect these 3D reconstruction with 3D generative model techniques. So achieving this would probably require notions that cannot be modeled by physics alone, such as human intentions, styles, functionalities, and, and other aspects of the scenes. To solve this issue, so I attend to 3D generative models. Well, now speaking of 3D generative models, um, a big question is how should we actually represent 3D data? So in image generative models, we represent 
images as pixels and we generate the pixel values. And for language models, we generate the tokens. So what exactly should we generate for 3D generative models? Uh, previously, in 2D generative models, people use uh, pixel representations and uh, CNNs. But directly extending that to 3D, uh, meaning voxels, would uh, quickly uh, become uh, invisible because of the, uh, the curse of dimensionality. <clears throat> And other more compact representations, such as mesh or point clouds, have their own downsides. For example, mesh, uh, you have to deal with unknown number of vertices and then arbitrary connections that are discrete, which is very difficult to generate with neural network. So there wasn't really a really suitable representation for a 3D generative model back then. Uh, and thus, we introduce uh, in, in our paper, DeepSCF, uh, we introduce a new continuous representation for, um, for 3D representation. So I won't go into too much detail, but just to give you a brief insight of what, the, what it is, is that it basically um, represents the surface as a decision boundary of a neural network. So this network, neural network takes in the x, y, z coordinates, and then it classifies whether this point is inside or outside. And that by doing so, it learns to discriminate the, uh, the boundaries of the surfaces, and, and thus representing the surface as a decision boundary of the neural network. So essentially, the 3D data is represented as a function. So this function, uh, as I said, takes the x, y, z coordinates, and then it processes with a neural network f, and it outputs some 3D data. It could be you know, colors, SDFs, or volumetric data, and, and so on. So in the literature, uh, people call this representation neural implicit representation, or sometimes we call it neural fields. And it has been a, um, a really important concept in, in 3D generative model domain. So some of the benefits of using this implicit representation um, meaning you generate basically the functions uh, to represent 3D data, is that it is continuous because you can query an uh, arbitrary x, y, z position, and it's memory efficient, uh, differentiable, and can express arbitrary topologies. And it has been uh, adopted as backbone for many of the 3D generative models. And once you train a generative model with using this uh, implicit representation, you essentially get a latent space of, of these shapes. So meaning that you can have a nice um, known distribution where you can sample these shapes and that the sample shapes looks reasonable or, or, or realistic uh, with respect to your training data. And to verify this, you can conduct interpolation in this latent space and that you can see that it, um, these shapes interpolate smoothly and outputs reasonable shapes. And, and since you have these uh, generative models, you can conduct um, interesting applications. For example, uh, given some partial observations like this depth maps, um, you can complete the, uh, the backside of the shapes that are not visible using these generative models. And compared to the ground truth, uh, you can see that our models does uh, quite well compared to uh, previous voxel-based representations. So this neural implicit representation has been adopted for um, various domains, including um, solving for differential equations, or uh, reconstructing the scene, or um, you know, even modeling for biomolecules or black holes. But many of these methods require representing, uh, requires the 3D data to train these models. But oftentimes, you, you're, you only have these 2D images from online yet you can actually collect millions of these uh, 2D images uh, that are, you don't have any multi-view data set for. So you only have these single instances of, of images for on the online. And that we, in our paper, SOLID-CF, we try to um, still train a 3 d generative model from these uh, sparse data sets. So how does it work? We uh, slightly tilt a um, neural network to output the um, geometry and color. But because we don't have ground truth data for 3D, we cannot do a simple regression of that. So we turned into a alternative technique called um, a generative adversarial network. So to give you a, a little bit of explanation of that, what it is in 2D, um, the generator randomly samples a noise, noise vector, and that from that noise vector generates uh, some type of image. And then it puts into the discriminator 
and it tells you whether this image is from the real distribution or the generated distribution. And by a, um, alternatively training this generator and discriminator in an adversarial sense, they fight each other, uh, the generator learns to fool the discriminator and generates realistic images. And in the context of 3D generative adversarial networks, you similarly start with a random noise, and you put that into our neural implicit representation that outputs essentially a function that represents the 3D data. And because it's, it's a function, you can query at any position what is the 3D data it represents, and you can render this from arbitrary viewpoint. <laughs> and once you render this from a, an arbitrary camera position, you, you tell the discriminator whether this rendering looks realistic or not with respect to your training data. And then, um, similar to the 2D cases, the generator and discriminator fight each other so that the generator can generate a realistic 3D scene that renders realistic 2D images. And along with several other um, techniques, I won't go into details, um, it ter turns out that our, we can train 3D generative models that are really realistic. So these are some of the samples um, from our models. Um, so you can see that this sample um, is highly realistic in textures and geometry. There's a random, random um, sampling that of, of humans and, and animals that don't exist in the world. And because it's 3D, you can rotate it around, view it from uh, multiple angles. And here's another example. And we try to extend it to um, 4D generative models. Uh, I won't go into details, but essentially, uh, Instead of modeling the 3D uh, functions that takes XYZ position, you can uh, change it to taking XYZ T position and then, you know, massage it to a little bit and, and get this 4D result pretty straightforward. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you can train this from a set of videos. And a nice property of this is that you can do motion decomposition, so you can have a different person, a different 3D person have a different motions and um, you can have uh, two identities have um, two same identities to perform different motions. In this field of 3D generative models, uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of progress recently, so this is not my paper, but um, some of the recent works is able to uh, sample highly realistic um, 3D models just from text prompts. And this is another example that you can do even like really complex scenes um, using 3D generative models. <laughs> so there are many breakthroughs we've seen in object level generative models. So I wanted to focus on uh, the next step. So how can we generate uh, beyond objects, which is to generate uh, large and compositional scenes. So recently in uh, ICCV, um, I, me and my collaborators uh, published a paper uh, called Generative Novelty Synthesis. So uh, it can do some unbounded 3D generations of arbitrary scenes from a single input image. So here you're seeing that there's uh, one um, input image given to this network and you can generate novelties of the scene like going straight, uh, straight, uh, you know, straight motion to camera and it looks uh, reasonably realistic. And the key is uh, we're applying a, a different uh, representation um, to, to represent the scene. So usually object level um, generative models represent their scenes in a um, um, Cartesian coordinates, X, Y, Z boxes, but we, we're trying to make it more flexible. So um, we model the scene with a camera frustum coordinates. And within this camera first sum, we similarly define the implicit neural implicit representations uh, from the uh, features extracted from the image. So you can uh, continuously query these um, features and get um, the features and the occupancy out of that. And because it's, we have this representation, we can render these uh, features from arbitrary camera perspective and then try to regress that to a ground truth uh, novel view. However, regression technique uh, is known to give you pretty blurry outputs because there are a lot of uncertainties of your predictions and your regress output is essentially the average of this distribution, multimodal distribution, so which becomes a pretty blurry prediction. 
So instead of doing regression, we apply a uh, conditional diffusion models. So um, this diffusion models is conditioned on these 2D feature image that you just rendered from this novel viewpoint. And then uh, it is trained to denoise these uh, novel views so that it's, it is um, realistic and then corresponds to the ground truth image. And then you can continuously expand this uh, neural field. You're expanding the scene you're generating by adding more and more of these um, frustum features. And the result of that is, given a single image, you can um, render the scene from arbitrary viewpoints, which, which looks pretty realistic, uh, especially compared to the state of the arts. And you can do it for uh, slightly larger scenes. You can uh, see that given an image, you can walk around. Or you can even turn around and then go forward, and so on. Uh, one interesting aspect that I want to point out is that these models are able to sample the possible states of reality. So a lot of problems that we face in engineering is about recovering the unobserved complete data from partial observations. So given an input image, we want to uh, recover the full 3D data, which is obviously multimodal distribution because there are many possible answers. So typically, the traditionally what people do is they do maximum likelihood estimation, which is find the, the argmax, uh, to find one point that uh, maximizes the probability, uh, which results in the, as I said, the uh, average of the distribution resulting in blurry predictions. However, using generative models, we can actually sample from this uh, probability distribution. So each of the samples are more crisp, and then di you can sample diverse possible completions of your observations. An example of that is this case where you have an input image and you can go through the scene and you have you can see that the reconstruction has slightly different wall paintings. And if you go further from here, you can see that the 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 room that reconstructed from these tiny little patches at the end of the corridor is actually reasonable, but they are diverse and different. Which really shows this uh, possibilities of sampling the uh, different states of reality. And then some other works uh, that I've done towards uh, compositional scene modeling, because uh, you can decompose the scene into multiple objects, and that often increases your, um, your ability to, to generate and model the, the complex scenes. So one work that recently published, where it's called CC3D, so we're given a, instead of generating the entire scene from scratch, we split it into two stages. The first is a planning stage where we're giving this 2D input layout to the network, which could be generated by neural network or user can draw it themselves, the, depending on what type of scene they want to generate. And then given this uh, 2D layout, our method can generate the 3D scenes pretty nicely. I won't go into details, Here's some of the result. So you can generate these scenes pretty nicely, and, and these are all drawn by humans. And since this is, is drawn, it's easy to edit the scene. And here's another example. And how do you actually generate these, um, these floor plans automatically without human, human inputs? Was, uh, is about, th this is about, um, this paper is about that question, so generalizing realistic object arrangement of a scene. We pose it as a diffusion model task, so um, the denoising process, uh, the denoising process makes the clean scene into a very noisy scene, and the denoising scene is the, the reverse process. Uh, this is, we are inspired, but different from the, um, the image uh, diffusion models, we do it on the, the transformation space of the, um, the, the layouts, the object transformation matrices. The result is that we were able to recover regularity rules just from uh, you know, throwing data into the, into the uh, diffusion models. So you can see that it learns to, learns to you know, rearrange the scene with particular geometric rules, which is pretty nice. And I can show you these process in, in the videos. So from this messy scene, you can see that this method can rearrange the scene pretty nicely. And in another example, we can add noise to this uh, process to make it more robust to the, to the local minimum. Then it does it you know, as the diffusion model does. <coughs> So obviously, this technique will be useful for 3D designers who can just throw, just dump the object into the uh, scene and then it suggests a 
nice, um, reasonable, stylish um, rearrangement of the scene. Or it could be used for cleaning robots who, you know, needs to clean our scene but doesn't know the rules. We don't, we don't have to uh, manually specify the rules and it would be nice to automatically uh, learn the rules, what it means to be a clean scene. So in the future, um, I want to work on large, dynamic, interactive scene generations. Right now, a lot of the uh, generative models we have are not interactive. We're just able to see them, visualize them uh, in different viewpoint, but there's no interaction. So it would be nice to have to generate these kind of scenes where you can um, actually drive in and your actions will, be, uh, will affect the uh, reactions of the other agents within the scene. <clears throat> I want to point out there's a lot of applications of 3D, 4D uh, Gen AI in, in various aspects, such as robotics to predict the, uh, the future, um, future predictions, or medical imaging for you, you know, uh, sampling the possible um, states from the probability distribution if you have those three generative models, or uh, for scientific imaging for uh, reconstructing bi biomolecules and their um, heterogeneous states. So I want to briefly go over um, the social challenges and impact of these methods. I'm, I'm pretty you know, afraid that in maybe 10 years, there's going to be only AI posting and chatting each other on the internet. So in Twitter or Reddit, it's going to be 99.9% .9 of the content will be AI generated. And what will we do? And how is going to culture change? I'm, I'm very curious how we're going to deal with these issues. And I recently found out, uh, you know, found a clip where this uh, Kim Kardashian is talking to, uh, I forgot his name, um, but this person. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but then this is actually uh, deep fake. So this is generated uh, completely um, from uh, different actors and actresses, but they changed the face with Kim Kardashian. So this um, could pose significant challenge to our society. And my solutions, I thought very deeply about this problems, actually suggested by ChatGPT. <laughs> what it says is that we should regulate and oversee this and have open discussions. So different committees come over and have discussions. And we need global cooperations between companies and different governments. And we need transparency of whether this um, content is coming from AI or humans. And we need some robust fact checking, but I'm worried that there's going to be some adversarial training where this is fighting between the generator and discriminator. And ethical AI like, like this uh, conference. Uh, and then people should be educated to have more media literacy. And then we need to protect the privacy and creativity more. But despite these shortcomings, I believe that the promise and the responsibilities of AI is large enough that we should continue working on these problems. Uh, one phenomenon that I observe is that our uh, population is really aging, especially in the developed nations. So this is the uh, population pyramid in 1996. We used to have a lot of uh, younger populations. And, and now in, in uh, 2036, we expect that we're going to have about 30% of the people will be uh, aged more than six. 60 years old. And this phenomenon is more severe in some countries like Japan, Italy, South Korea, where in Japan, for example, it's going to be expected that 40% of the population will be over age 60, uh, and that the population will keep decreasing. And in, in, in the US, we're uh, experiencing huge labor shortage in various areas like healthcare, restaurants, hotel, construction workers, cleaners, and so on. And I see if you go to New York, there's a lot of trash on the you know, subway that no one wants to or no one cares to um, clean up. And a lot of younger generation increasingly avoid these uh, dangerous works. And then we need uh, a lot of workforces for senior cares, domestic cares, and, and driving, so on. So I, I believe it's pretty obvious, and we need these assistive robots to be able to deal with this uh, issue to avoid a total collapse of our society. And we need AIs definitely to develop these robots that I can adopt to this, uh, adapt to these new environments. And because of the aging population, the importance of medical uh, breakthroughs such as imaging, this is, this is detections or drug discoveries are ever increasing. And lastly, I want to point out that we're experiencing this, um, you know, huge climate crisis. Um, you can see that the 
um, temperature has, you know, spiking in the last hundred years or fifty years that um, that has never experienced before. And a lot of scientists uh, say that the plus two Celsius degrees is a critical point where you cannot reverse it because of the reinforcing uh, feedback loop, where uh, as it gets warmer, the ocean releases more CO two. And that makes the atmosphere more warmer, and that's like a feedback loop that, that you, it's very, very difficult to stop. And another feedback loop is uh, the ice melts, and then that becomes uh, increasing the, the temperatures and so on. So I think the responsibility of AI uh, should uh, focus on you know, these very important tasks, uh, very important uh, issues of, of human societies. And one possible example is doing energy research, uh, for example, finding uh, more efficient catalysts for, for example, uh, hydrogen electrolysis. And another example could be using uh, 3D generative models uh, for shape optimization and solve differential equations, such as magnetic fields, to, um, to get a, a better and sustainable uh, nuclear fusion energy and so on. So, yeah, we should do research as soon as possible in this domain. So in, in conclusion, uh, I, I talked about my research on 3D generative models, uh, large-scale dynamic interactive scene generation, which is my future work, and has wide application domains. And um, even though AI induces so many challenges, such as uh, fake media, I think humanity is, uh, nevertheless, we need to develop AI to deal with the, our, um, our crisis. And that's it. Uh, thank you very much. And please ask questions if you have.